Thank you very much, Prabhu, for that kind introduction to Christopher and Antonam for inviting me here to share some of my journey with you today. Um, I want to begin just by reading um, an extract from Professor Wood's paper. In terms of behavior, ethics begin at the first cry of human suffering, at the point where one finds oneself facing another person. It prevents us from being indifferent to the suffering of others. A fortiori, if we ourselves have caused it. That theme will be running through my presentation. Um, and I would also say that many of the themes that have been picked up this morning um, are also going to resonate in my presentation, which I rewrote last night, having absorbed some of the energy and the themes in the conference. And I promise you, for example, that, that George Colreiser and I have not con contrived and conspired to come up with pretty much the same sort of messages. I'm going to start off with um, money. This is a £20 note sterling. It has Liz's face on the front here. And underneath the words Bank of England, fortunately not Bank of Scotland, it says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of £20. On the back of a dollar bill, it says, In God we trust. Money is founded on moral virtue. Money is a promise we trust. If we break promises, we destroy trust and we destroy money. And that is one, set, one way of seeing the banking and cri financial crisis that we have just endured. So, if we can begin with my presentation. So I'm going to be talking about insights into the moral DNA of the corporation. But before we do that, we need to look at insights into the moral DNA of humanity. Where do we begin? Well, there are a lot of French speakers in here. I will not say this in French. But, li <laughs> but life is the sum of all our choices. Perhaps a French man or woman can shout out the translation. If you can get the exact words Albert Camus used, then you get a prize. No, okay, we'll move on. So for me, our ethics, our morality is about the choices we make. But where do those choices come from? So I have a very simple formula, which is that our character, who we are as moral agents, the judgments we make as human beings on our own, but more importantly together, give rise to the behaviors which help to create and sustain or undermine, if they're the wrong behaviors, a moral community. So where does ethics begin? This is my point of view. We are born, as you can see, we are born as infants, helpless infants, are Ethos is the ethic of ego. What's right is what's best for me, and it's perfectly right. In fact, there is a moral imperative for the infant to survive. It is a physical, powerful, internal driver of behavior. It resides in the reptilian brain complex. And, ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, that ethic of ego remains part of who we are throughout our lives. But as we become aware of our parents and their instructions to do things and not do things, do as I do, do as I say, not as I do, we begin to understand the next interpretation of what is right, is what is right is doing what we're told. Do not think, just obey. The consequences of compliance are reward, the consequence for disobedience for is punishment. And it's driven by fear. Fear, again, is a very powerful reptilian uh, force. But the ethic of obedience is not to do with us. It's actually more to do with, with an external force acting upon us, controlling our ego. Again, it resides in the reptilian brain complex. We are also born with the ethic of care. Contemporary neuroscience is uncovering huge amounts of evidence which strongly suggest that we are born to love. What's right is what's best for all of us. It's not a question of self-interest or altruism. It's about enlightened self-interest. It maps to the moral values of love, of fairness, and humility. 
It's an interactive driver of behaviour. It's not just external or internal. It's about our relationships one with another. It builds social and community integrity. And we can see the physiological foundation for this in the brain's limbic system, which we share with all mammals, and, for example, the hormone oxytocin. Finally, we have the ethic of reason. What's right is what I or we judge is right. We, um, we make a rational calculus. It is mapped to the moral values of wisdom and, crucially, self-control. Self-control is the antidote to ego. It is about our personal integrity. It is, again, like the ego, an internally developed driver of behavior. And it resides in the human neocortex. So where's the proof for this? Well, there is no proof, but we've been conducting moral DNA profiling for two years now online. Some of you have done the test, and I'll be sharing your aggregate results with you shortly. We have a total database now in excess of 50,000 human beings from over 162 countries. The first one I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to use my Star Wars lightsaber, is our ethic of obedience. The blue line here, which you can see starting top left, and as we mature, these are age groups going from left to right on the lower axis. And you can see our ethic of obedience is in retreat throughout our lives. I don't have time to talk about what happens when we get into our 60s. At the same time, the ethic of reason is becoming more and more dominant. Statistically speaking, it is an inverse correlation, ladies and gentlemen. To believe that we can actually change grown-up human behavior with more legislation, more regulation, has no foundation in science or psychology. If you tell people what to do, they stop working it out for themselves. In the corporation, in government, in any workplace institution, you will see people making this argument. If the rules do not say this is wrong, therefore it is right. If the rules do not say this is wrong, therefore it is right. And we get the obscenities of things like retailing groups believing it's okay to sell pole dancing kits to young girls as old as six and seven years old at Christmas. Because it's not illegal. And you can see the ethic of care, which is that red line running through the middle, the red thread. It barely increases throughout our lifetime. That is the ethic of care. Now, there's a gender difference as well. So age is a factor. Gender is a factor. You can guess, I imagine, the difference in genders. On the left, we have exhibit A, men. On the right, we have exhibit B, women. There is a significant difference on the ethic of care. This is what, in statistical terms, we call, excuse my French, the bleeding obvious. But those of you with sharp eyes will also see that on each of those three moral dimensions, the ethic of obedience, the ethic of care, and the ethic of reason, women are outscoring men on all three. Discuss, not now. We are also now measuring 10 moral values, and you need to read this radar graph like a clock. At 12 o'clock, which is the moral value of love, you will see the red line, uh, which you then follow around the clock, and beneath it at 12 o'clock is the blue line, which is for us men, boys. So you can see a reflection of the ethic of care in the way that women are actually looking at... Uh, living the value of love, the biggest difference between the two. Someone saying hormones. I heard that. But also, and my wife uh, explained to me why women are, have higher scores on excellence. I can always do better. Thank you, Jane. That hope is higher in women because you have to live with men like us. I said, what about being rough, tough alpha males? And she said, yes, but you've never had a baby. I said, good point. And then when it came to women have a higher score on humility compared with us men, I said, what does this mean? She said, look at your business card. It has your photograph on the front. <laughs> but
for fairness, trust, and honesty, uh, it is, uh, there is no statistical difference, but men are scoring higher on wisdom and on self-control. Ladies and gentlemen, bankers in financial services do not demand million and multi-billion million dollar uh, bonuses because they're greedy. They do it because they're egocentric and arrogant. That is also a conclusion of our research. And the quickest way to sort out remuneration in, in the C-suite and in bankers is to give everyone a medal. Okay, I promised Zermatt Summit analysis. Um, humanity, our control group here is 15,686 people. That's the blue column. Zermatt Summit delegates, of which 67 of you completed a profile, is the red column. And you can see that on each one of those three factor scales, you are scoring higher than humanity. But you may be concerned to note that the ethic of care is the lowest of the three within this group. I've also mapped the moral values, the 10 moral values. You score quite hardly. You're above the norm on six of them, on the norm with one, but lower than the norm on the uh, moral value of humility, which is the lowest, excellence and wisdom. So the, the challenge for those of us here today is to uh, take the lesson that I learned from Jane, my wife, which is to not be tempted to put your photograph on your business card. So moving on. So what are the roots of, hum of uh, human morality? And I need to then to move swiftly onto the corporation. Well, this is, um, again, work in progress, but we are born out of love. We survive and grow because others love us and care for us which is why I read out that earlier paragraph, and we love them back, respect them, treat them fairly, etc. That's why moral values are so important. We call this, ladies and gentlemen, an experiment called family, friendship, and community. It's only been going for at least 15,000 years, so maybe jury's out on it. We reinforce our sense of family, friendship, and community through social learning and social decision-making. We call social learning and social decision-making religion, education, politics, and culture. So, insights into the moral DNA of the corporation. Oh, dear. Uh, this is a, a graph you can't read in detail, but I'm very happy to share this with you. I've just summarized. If you look on the right side of the graph, that is where we have the highest aggregate scores on moral DNA. And not surprisingly, we see a focus and a concentration of caring professions and occupations. The highest scoring occupation is homemaker. Not a builder. Homemaker, motherhood, parenthood. In the middle is the raft of consumer businesses delivering goods and services to us. Banks, by the way, come right in the middle. We do get the banks we deserve. But at the bottom of the class are those occupations where machines are more important than people. So we see heavy industry, utilities, technology. We also measure leadership. Here again are our 10 moral values. I'm not gonna go through all of them. You may notice that two of them, as we're going through the corporation on the left-hand side, are level one employees, moving to the right with the level five board. Two moral values are in serious decline as we move up the greasy pole of the corporate ladder, mixing metaphors there. The two in decline are humility, no surprise there. The other one is love. So do you recognize any of these characteristics in the corporation? Callous unconcern for the feelings of others, incapacity to experience uh, enduring relationships, regard, reckless disregard for the safety of others, deceitfulness, repi repeated lying and conning others for profit, incapacity to experience guilt, failure to conform to social norms with respect to lawful behaviours. We see those behaviours throughout the corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, that's an extract from the World Health Organization Diagnosis for Psychopathy. The moral DNA of of the corporation I will summarize like this and I emphasize the corporation as a legal construct not people in corporations the corporation is a legal person but has no conscience or soul directors have legal obligations to the company
but not to any human group or individual. The behavior of human beings operating within this environment is controlled through bribery, that's my interpretation of reward, fear, and sham obedience to between 10,000 and 40,000 rules and regulations, depending on the industry. This totalitarian construct is morally corrupt and has no place in social democracies. The corporation, in terms of its form, as a form of human association, is much closer to North Korea than it is to Switzerland, France, and so on. We have the concept of the dear leader, the CEO. We have the language of execution when it comes to strategies. And we have the language of termination when it comes to human beings. You could be in a death camp. So how do we fix the corporation? We must ask and answer these questions. And I do this when I go into boards of companies and talk to people in the C-suite. Why does your business exist? Trust me, I get a lot of silence after that question. The second question is, is your business a human community of belonging that customers, investors, employees, and society all truly love? How can your business sustain its economic purpose without being a human community of belonging, a safe place of belonging? And are you bringing your humanity to work? Are you as individuals bringing your humanity to work? And therefore, do you have integrity? The proposition there, ladies and gentlemen, if, if you do not bring your wholesome humanity to work, you do not de facto have integrity. You are not whole or complete. I am privileged to work with some amazing individuals in leadership roles in lots of corporations. I'm very privileged to work with a senior leader at HSBC Bank. I have permission to talk in very broad terms about the work we're doing together. It is the only UK listed bank to recapitalize with a vanilla rights issue post-crisis. It didn't need to be bailed out by taxpayers or by certain dodgy sovereign wealth funds. It is the only UK bank to say publicly last week that ring-fencing the retail bank from the investment bank is actually a good idea. It is the first UK bank to begin an ethics program for its leaders that is founded on the proposition that unless we bring humanity to work, we do not have integrity. This program is called Lead with Courageous Integrity. Stuart Gulliver, the new group CEO, has talked about it openly in the Financial Times. We are currently putting 8,000 leaders in the UK through a two-day program to discover the human within them. I'm going to finish with an appeal. The appeal is for you to help me write a book. My next book, which is called The Power of Love in Business, How to Get Your Humanity to Work. What I would like is anyone here, or if you know anyone, who has love stories in business or at work, which shows how people have brought their humanity to work for the benefit of the common and greater good. 800 to 1,200 words would be about right. And there's an email address for you to send it to. So please help me help people bring their humanity to work. And I believe, and I've seen it, it's already making a difference. That is the end of my presentation. <laughs>